My name is Roberta Buiani, and I'm the director of the Alsace Salon, which is a program uh, dedicated to uh, facilitating dialogues between artists, scientists, technologists, uh, activists, and indigenous scholars. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, my partner, <laughs> Uh, Jane Kingley was here today. Um, this is uh, a collaboration, is part of a collaboration between uh, Artside Salon and Slow Lab, which um, uh, Jane uh, runs at York University. And uh, uh, we, um, like it, it's made thanks to the generous, generous contribution of Shirk um, and uh, from uh, the generously, generous hosting of uh, the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Science, which is the place where we are here right now. Um, I would like to do the land acknowledgement, and I understand that some people uh, from home are coming from uh, all over the place, so I encourage you to think about the land where you are sitting in this moment. I wish to acknowledge this land in Toronto, in which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga, Mississauga saw the credit. Today, uh, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So thank you. Um, so today, uh, the focus um, will be on ecology and symbiosis uh, and the relationship between plants and humans and actually other organisms and other objects. Um, so in addition to addressing ecological symbiosis, um, with this uh, panel and roundtable, uh, we would also like to continue a um, conversation that we started a few weeks ago with the first uh, panel. And uh, I see that um, uh, some, some of you were here uh, from last time. And uh, that focused on ethics of uh, care. And, but I will also like to address uh, some of the uh, discussions and some of the um, things that I observed uh, during uh, our poetry night, uh, which took place uh, last uh, week. Um, so in all occasions, uh, we, have been, we have seen that the notion of symbiosis does not just uh, pertain to the natural world, but also comes from uh, cross-pollinations of different disciplines. Uh, from multi-species ecologies and from uh, cross-species coexistence and survival. Uh, during the poetry night, uh, then um, images, sounds, spoken words, and the architecture that hosted us, uh, that beautiful staircase that you see outside, um, somehow responded to us and resonated to us and worked in a very beautiful way and very surprising way um, that we would have never even imagined. And to me, it was a kind, a sort of form of symbiosis that we were able to observe there. Um, so um, during the previous uh, roundtable, we have uh, taken, uh, we have talked about um, care and mutualism, um, which is a quite uh, urgent and important challenge uh, that requires thinking differently in order to adopt an ethics of inclusion that embraces uh, multiplicity and complexity as a starting point for resituating the human in relation to its environment. Um, so, um, so here is just a starting point, and I have uh, some questions that I've already uh, shared with my uh, uh, with my host, with my guest. Uh, but um, I would like to um, invite our guest. We have three guests today, and uh, they will uh, talk for roughly fifteen to twenty minutes each. And uh, after which we will um, have a little discussion among each other, and then we will open the floor uh, to discussion for discussion uh, to the rest of the audience. And of course, um, you're very welcome to also like raise your hand in between and and um, come in and say something. Um, so I would like to introduce the first speaker. So we the order of speakers will be, and and you Trent. Lindsay French uh, will be the second one where she or oh, she's there, and uh, uh, Doline Tisawi uh, Chaki uh, Manning she will be the third one. Um, 
So uh, first, Andrew. Andrew Tranti is an associate professor at the University of Waterloo. And he is working in the School of the Environment, uh, Resource and Sustainability, and is the director of the Trent Ecology Legacies Lab. Um, I went on his website. I loved the way in which he is de describing uh, how symbiosis and ecologies, and all the different ways in which uh, uh, symbiosis and ecologies work. Um, uh, as we were talking uh, uh, this week, uh, I was uh, remarking that uh, symbiosis is working very much horizontally and vertically. So I, I think he's going to explain this. Um, so whether through eco uh, cultural legacies associated with long-term human settlements or more recent effects of climate change on species um, redistribution or biodiversity, Andrew Trent is interested in uh, disentangling the drivers of these changes. His work uh, takes him to the subarctic or Labrador and to the Great Bear Rainforest and the coast uh, mountains of British Columbia. Andrew also has a long history of partnering with First Nations and local communities. And having only recently joined SIRS, um, I hope I uh, pronounced it correctly, Andrew is currently developing a local research uh, program that examines uh, range expansion and species distribution of a um, variety of herbaceous plant and tree species. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And sorry for my lengthy introduction. Thank you very much. If I clip that on, is that close enough? Can everyone hear? Okay, and I was half paying attention during this um, when I was being told how to use this, and it worked. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, the work I'm going to talk about tonight um, is situated in the Great Bear Rainforest. And so this is work that has been developed uh, with partnerships with the Helpsic and the Wikinu First Nations um, and supported by the Hakai Institute. Um, a lot of this work, um, I'm up here talking, but it's really a group of dedicated grad students and postdocs that have been pushing this work forward. Um, so this is our lab, Ecological Legacies Lab. Um, we have stickers made up. And so if you want a sticker, please come and see me after. They're free. Um, so people have been interacting with landscapes for a really long time. And sometimes these interactions and modifications that result from that are really obvious. So if we look at uh, a photo by Ed Bertinsky, it takes a minute to figure out what we're looking at. And this is a large kind of crop agricultural area. And for scale, um, these are this is the farm and trucks in the bottom corner. So if we're thinking about biodiversity and we're thinking about species that may have existed on this landscape before people started interacting with it, there are probably very few to no uh, species that persist. So that's a pretty obvious um, example of these modifications. If you were walking through the temperate rainforest in BC, you could easily walk across, walk past this western red cedar and not realize that it has been exposed to indigenous logging, and there was a plank removed from this tree, a fairly large size plank, probably about 100 to 200 years ago. And so this is kind of the, that extreme, really broad scale modifications and really small, um, more subtle modifications. And these more subtle changes and modifications can be scaled up. So if we take a little mine trip down to Amazonia um, and we think about the wild and incredible diversity of tree species in the Amazon rainforest, um, this is a place that is often celebrated as being uh, some of the last untouched wilderness in the world. And if we look at a, a map of Amazonia and the black circles, the bigger ones have more species and the color gradient corresponds to where people have been living for millennia, there's a really tight relationship to where people are and where richness, where the most species occur. So if we're thinking about that relationship between people and environments, um, this is a system that is really domesticated by people. So the word wild um, is, is problematic. It, is, it ignores a lot of history, and it really ignores a lot of these long-term um, interactions. So this is a really fun night for me to come and talk about symbiosis. Um, and I think a lot about systems from kind of a um, a social ecological 
context where we cannot separate people from landscapes and the, the decisions that we make are persistent. And so I think a lot about stewardship and long-term management um, and interaction with landscapes. And just as, as an ecologist, which is where my training, um, my training lies, it's all about interconnectedness and it's really impossible to do one thing. We're really good at doing many things, but we're quite terrible at just doing one thing because of all of these interconnected pathways. So that's kind of how I, I think about symbiosis. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about some work that we've been working on for a number of years um, on the central coast of British Columbia in the Great Bear Rainforest. So we're on these outer islands. This is Calvert Island. Um, and it's a really amazing place ecologically, and it's a really amazing place culturally. Um, without getting into the, uh, all of the details of why that is, um, for many, many years, thousands and thousands of years, uh, this part of the world was covered in, a, in an ice sheet. And that pushed down on the mainland of BC and pushed all of the land, like a stepping on a balloon, kind of squishes out. So everything to the left was kind of higher than it was before. And then as those uh, ice sheets retreated, you have this isostatic rebound. So the landscape is changing a lot, except along this hinge point where um, Calvert Island is. So a forest on this site has been a forest for over 14,000 years. And that's, and that's unique along the coast. Um, and so like Amazonia, um, this is often uh, sold in terms of tourism as going to a, a, one of these places on earth where uh, you don't see people. And that's just absolutely untrue. Um, and it's really problematic when we think about this long term, um, so many, so, so many uh, generations of people living on this landscape and interacting and, and modifying this landscape. So I'm going to kind of do a step by step and talk about people and talk about um, uh, uh, management of, of, of clams and ultimately um, the impact that has on forests as kind of a, a way of thinking about symbiosis through long-term stewardship. And so here we are. This is in the Great Bear Rainforest, but it only rains really in the winter. Um, and so that's the, the research facility. Um, and it's a really, just a lot of like white sand beaches and a pretty almost tropical feeling place if it was only a bit warmer. Um, and it rains a lot, but really that does happen in the colder, uh, stormier winter months. Um, there's really productive forests. So we think about these classic um, temperate rainforests. That does occur, and I'm going to show you a little bit as to why. Um, but then there's also a lot of areas where the productivity is a lot lower. So it's a, it's a mix. Um, and so if we zoom in on the outer circle there um, along a place called May Channel, um, it's a really interesting place for archaeologists. So uh, archaeologists have been working um, with communities in this region for a long time. So indigenous and non-indigenous archaeologists looking for these early records of when people showed up on the coast. Um, and so this is a, a pit that they were digging in the intertidal zone. So they're working at low tide, knowing that they have, in this case, about 12 hours before the tide comes back up and washes out all of their work. So they're not very deep. It's about um, you know, 60 centimeters deep. And they're working along and got really excited when they found this. To an ecologist, I, I didn't share the excitement. Um, I didn't really understand what was so exciting. I'm not sure if it, from where you are, if it, you can kind of see what that might be. If you look in really closely, so these are footprints. And these footprints are really, really old. So they are just footprints in sand. It's a family unit. There, there were repeated sizes of what they assumed to be a mother, a father, and a small child walking across this beach 13 to 14,000 years ago. And then something happened, and that something was probably a storm event, and sediment covered those footprints, and they were preserved. So they, they are not petrified. They are not stone. They are just depressions in the sand from people's feet walking across the beach. So pretty, pretty remarkable. And getting into this idea of like how how long has this landscape been stewarded for well it's we're looking at over 13,000 years um, just to put it into context and to think about who I am and where I'm coming from in my perspectives um, my mother is uh, English and French from St. Malo and from my father's side um, from Ireland and our family story is that we can go back um, to the Trant family manor and we can go back about 400 years of of thinking about um, our that side of the family. 16 generations. Um, we do not own the Trant Manor anymore. 
Um, this is kind of the embarrassing part of the story. It is now the largest bovine insemination place in all of Ireland. So if you, <laughs> it's not, not really the, the riches that we were hoping for when we were tracing back our family tree. Um, so a couple of years ago, right before COVID, um, I had a sabbatical year. So we went and lived in Ireland for a while. And we lived, this was totally another side of the country. We rented this house out in the country. And this is in, in County Kerry in Dingle. And there's an old map in the house and we started you know you spend a couple weeks and uh looking at it without really paying attention and then we start reading that map and we start to see the trans surname showing up on many of these different place names and it turns out that we were staying on um old family land um, that had been in that trans side for about 800 years so i'm trying to build this like idea of this is a really long time from a, a european perspective of being able to, especially from a, um, a settler perspective of, of thinking about family and thinking about ancestry, 32 generations. If we jump back to these footprints, over 500 generations. So more than an order of magnitude longer. So we think about knowledge systems, we think about the development of knowledge and the application of knowledge and activity on the landscape. It's just, it's just can't really compare it. So, so that's where we are, Central Coast. People have been living continuously for over that period of time. For most of that time, they, um, people were eating resources from the sea, and clams play a big role in, in that, that dietary piece. When you are eating a lot of clams, um, there's these shell middens that develop. So uh, in some cases, these, this is a relatively small shell midden, about a half a meter. But if you were walking in the forest here, um, where the near where the footprints were found, the footprints were found probably over here. If you fell into that hole, you would go down um, with more than a two story house and it shell midden the whole way down. Again, building this idea of just how long um, th those interactions have been happening with clams coming from the sea and then um, being put into the forest. This is a very big scalable question if we think about how many shell middens there are how many village sites um, there were on the coast and many of them are still there but this is like over 5,000 of these really well developed shell middens so these ideas of of the implications and these connections between pieces are really widespread up and down the coast um, this is only data for Canada so there are uh, middens all the way down through Washington state as well and so here we are back to that opening picture. Um, this is a clam garden. So this is a highly modified human system, a human uh, social ecological system, where this wall at really, really low tides, uh, you, can, you can see. And this wall is made up of rocks that have been moved um, through many generations. And the reason for moving it is to create better ham, clam, not ham, better clam habitat. And so clam gardens are this ingenious way of changing the niche space available for growing clams. So you build a wall, that area fills in with sediment and it becomes, um, you can see on the left-hand side, there's only that red area that's kind of highlighted, just a small amount of space for clams. On the right-hand side, that figure, you've got way more area for growing clams. And so this has been a really uh, time-tested uh, form of agriculture, form of um, marine, uh, uh, kind of uh, not fully domestication of the clams, but a way of really ensuring this food source as a persistent food source. And this is an unrelated video that my guess is is not going to play because the first one didn't play. I'm going to have to describe it to you. It's not going to work. I'll show you later if you want to see it. But inside of this clam is a little baby starfish. And so it has really un nothing to do with science, other than it's amazing. <laughs> And, and science is amazing. And it's cute, it really was. Okay, so, so thinking about these connections and these that kind of deep time human environment relationships, um, how do these clams interact with forest? I, I'm a forest ecologist, a plant ecologist. Why am I talking so much about clams? Um, so this is just a study site map and all these red circles are, are village sites. Um, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, um, but the sites, um, when you look at them right now is what they look like from the water. So these sites are forested, but these are old village sites and sites that are uh, what we call control sites where there wasn't a village. 
And then so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at how tall these trees were across the landscape, and we used LIDAR to do this. So we have um, these really wonderful landscape models of tree height. And across this whole region, along this coastal swath, um, the average tree height is about 16 meters. So they're not huge, hugely, hugely tall trees compared to some places, but this is what we're dealing with across the landscape. And this is the kind of the one graph I'm going to show you tonight. So I'm going to just kind of walk it, you through it slowly. Um, we have two different things I'm going to show you. One's in blue and one's in red. The blue is random points. So we just went along the coast, and this is from this LIDAR um, kind of really wonderful landscape model that we have. And we just take random locations and move away from them and measure tree height. And when we do this, this is sort of a pattern. There isn't really any clear signal. When you take these random points, the average tree height is about 16 meters. So we can kind of walk along, and that's really about the height of these trees. The next bit of data is the red part, and this is where we are on these village sites with these well-developed shell middens. And what we see is a really different pattern where the biggest trees we're seeing on this landscape are associated with these habitation sites. And it's quite different. I, it's a bit misleading. This doesn't start at zero, this starts at 14. So the trees actually don't look that much larger, but I want to try to super illustrate the point. Um, but without a, like, um, with, with, with great certainty, uh, these trees are so much bigger for the ones that are growing on the shell middens compared to things that are growing off of them. And there's that kind of slow decline. So there's this really incredible story of this long history of clams being brought, being farmed along the coast, being brought up into the forest, and then resulting in these larger trees. And um, the, the version of the story that um, we understand the best is that um, shell middens do all kinds of really neat things to forest ecosystems. And people have been using fire for millennia as a, as a form of stewardship and as a way of increasing food plants. So we have these two things together. And when we think about forest systems, um, we have these inputs that work there in other areas. So we have high calcium amounts. We have lots of charcoal from the fire. And these do all kinds of really wonderful things to forest systems. If we think about soil pH, which is a really big part, a big limiting factor of forest growth, it's really acidic there, the, the soils. So if we can buffer that acidity, trees love it and they grow really, really well. And they also have access to all kinds of nutrients, uh, including phosphorus. And so that's kind of the ideas as to why we're seeing such big trees associated with these clams. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, um, but we see these persistent legacies around all kinds of different species that are used on these sites. So it's not just trees, um, but there are calcium loving plants and plants that um, people have been stewarding and, and, and domesticating and using for millennia. Um, this is what the uh, kind of early depictions of what these sites look like uh, when they were in full use. And you can see the giant piles of midden that was used as a, a kind of a, a staging material, flattened to build houses on top of. There were trees, but they were kind of along the periphery. And this is what the sites look like now. Um, and I think it's a really important piece of this story is to talk about why they look like that now. Um, and so if we look at this map of when disease and famine moved across North America, some unintentionally, much of it intentional movement, um, it, you're it kind of moved from east to west. And so a lot of these sites have not been lived in for a couple hundred years. And so that's why there are trees growing uh, on many of them. It is, um, these sites are still absolutely being used and they're being used in some similar ways in some different ways. Um, and so it's kind of thinking, thinking about symbioses and thinking about these relationships, um, one of the really neat things is how plastic relationships are and how, how, how they can change as, as, as need changes and as opportunity changes. And so these sites, so for, um, for forever, um, people have been using cedar, uh, cedar bark. And so on the right is a picture of what a, a cedar that has been uh, had its bark removed uh, probably about 150 years ago. And you're seeing a lot of these sites that people are going and still removing cedar from. Um, I say cedar has been used forever. It actually didn't show up for um, about, or it was about 6,000 years after those footprints were put on the ground, did cedar show up on the coast. So cedar wasn't actually there 
when people arrived. Um, clam gardens are being restored. Thanks. Uh, clam gardens are being actively restored by many nations up and down the coast. And there are these great clam garden networks of people doing really wonderful work, um, bringing back uh, a lot of the traditions around clam gardens, but also repairing walls that were left unused for, for, um, for centuries. And so the last, in the last, I think I have about a minute and 30 seconds, um, I want to finish by talking about a really neat project um, that is led by my, my PhD student, Sarah Wickham, and working really closely with the Wicano Stewardship Council. And they approached us to do um, a restoration project with crab apple. And it's a really, to me, it's like the perfect kind of science where we were approached by the nation with uh, goals determined by the Stewardship Council and then working with uh, the nation and the guardians to implement it. Restoration, we often think of it as landscape recovery and returning landscapes back to a different form. Um, but there's also cultural restoration and, and thinking about stewardship and re-engaging with stewardship practices that aren't actively being used. Um, and so crab apple, I wish I had another three hours. Um, I love crab apples. I have three hours. Okay. Um, <laughs> we will have like half an hour. Okay. So, so crab apple orchards were some of the earliest domestication of plants in North America. Um, there's this total misconception of people not being anchored to landscapes and to place. And you can find uh, orchards of 100, 100 different, 100 individual trees on the coast. Where you find crab apples, people have been. It's like this really tight relationship between. Uh, orchard management, forest gardens, and people. Um, and so a lot of this restoration is around um, pruning, uh, adding fish, adding seaweed, and trying to bring back these historic forest gardens um, back into, into use. And I think this is really, to me, and this is a great place to leave it, and I'm going to be pulled off the stage soon anyway. Um, but the goals set out by the Stewardship Council were around making more crab apples. So increasing productivity, that's a pretty classic traditional goal of restoration. But the other two um, were really thinking about the cultural restoration piece and reconnecting, especially youth. So a lot of youth are involved with this project of going out and spending time in these forest gardens. And the last one, which is a really neat one, is for bears. And so if we're thinking about bears, bears are on the coast, black bears and grizzlies, um, really reliant on salmon. Salmon aren't always there. Crab apple is a, a, a totally loved species. And bears are a problem in the communities. Um, so the restoration of these old village sites with the orchards are bringing bears out of the communities and to these old villages. And the bears are absolutely loving it. So with that, I want to say thank you. And this is not this is a picture of Labrador. Um, so if anybody wants to talk about the Arctic, I kind of put this up here as a prompt. Um, so I think I was a little bit over. Sorry about that, but thank you very much. Thank you. Was much to say. <laughs> I know. Always. It's amazing. About a lot of stuff, right? So uh, I, I'm sorry. Like I, I wish we had three hours per uh, person to talk, um, but unfortunately we only have 15 to 20 minutes. And as you've seen, Anne is our uh, time taker, and she's great because she put the alarm on, so she will be ruthless. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. I'm always a little nervous getting started, but um, I'll put some here. Okay, so thank you so much um, for the invitation to be here today. I just want to extend a uh, thank you to Jane, um, and I'm so grateful to be um, in conversation with Andrew and with Darlene today. So, um, and that was a tough presentation to follow as well. I have so many questions already. <laughs> um, so today I'd like to focus on the work um, that I have up in the gallery, um, and then I would like to expand from that um, to include a couple of other pieces that I think um, also address the theme of symbiosis. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about um, if symbiosis can indicate a kind of mutually beneficial relationship, um, it can seem like this relationship is easy. And um, I'm interested in this, but I'm also interested in the kinds of relationships that challenge our understandings of other beings and um, remind us of their agencies um, in some of these challenging ways. Um, so if there's time, and I'm hopeful, um, I'll talk about two other projects um, 
with more specific um, uh, beings, one of them uh, Toxicodendron radicans or poison ivy, um, and the other mosquitoes, which um, there's like so many species of mosquitoes, I'm just going to say mosquitoes. <laughs> Um, and um, I'll also just from some uh, recent writing, um, which considers encounters with mosquitoes um, as a site for negotiation. Um, and so one of the um, methods that I use in my practice is to try to destabilize the human, perce human perception um, and the human perspective. And if I can play the videos from here. Um, these are like just some videos that are in the show, so we'll see if they play, um, and if not, that's okay. Ah, there we go. Um, so phytovision is an ongoing body of work in which I facilitate phytocentric or plant-centric um, experiences, reworking human-centered cultural objects um, like cinema or television or video that I shoot myself um, for plant perception. So I begin with video that's tailored for perception, for plant perception, um, but it's also expanded to include multi-sensory elements, um, such as video, the sonic, and the tactile, as well as scent, and then light more largely. And my goal in this work is not to claim a knowledge of plant experience, but to reposition the human and the plant relationship, and to ask questions like, is there something to learn in taking a more passive, um, position? Can practices rearranging traditional hierarchies allow a new way to value the marginal um, and to develop a comfort with ambiguity? And are there post-colonial practices to embody by reconsidering the ways in which we, we relate to one another? Um, and can practices of receptivity momentarily disorient us from the anxieties and failures of anthropocentrism and settler colonialism and orient us more towards reparative work. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, so the work in this, oh, it's not um, changing. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it's showing on here, but maybe since I played the video. Okay, she's getting you. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I tried the arrow. It didn't um, seem to do it. I mean, I can keep talking and we can catch up I with the visuals. The arrow is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the video? Uh, like it's not, I played the video and it worked, but now it won't move slides. Oh. This is like, I have my MFA in art and technology studies and this is like the curse of it <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could do some sort of like VJing for you all maybe. Yeah, it might be off topic. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Maybe I won't touch the videos and we can just look at images. Um, okay, so the work in this in the show, in the More Than Human exhibition, is oriented around an area um, that's currently called Cook Forest in an old growth pine and hemlock forest in Western Pennsylvania, um, where I spent a lot of my time visiting when I uh, moved to Pittsburgh in 2018. Um, and as I spent time there, I've learned a lot more about that place, which for time immemorial was Seneca land, seated in a disputed territory. This is a, a map showing some of, the, um, some of these cessations. Um, in 1784. And some of the trees in this area are estimated to be over 600 years old, um, so they began their growth in a time before settlers occupied the land. Um, and here's another map um, which locates uh, this area, just like if you're familiar with um, Pennsylvania, and it's that pink dot there. Um, 
Okay, I'm not going to play the videos for you. Okay, but we're going to, I'd like to turn our attention for a moment to the white pine, hemlock, and small plants on the forest floor whose images make up the work in this exhibition, uh, the videos in, the ex, in this piece. Um, and the image on this screen and a typical screen in here is made of three primary colors, red, green, and blue. And it's designed specifically for eyes with these three cones. Um, and so like the full color spectrum is not represented, of course, in the monitor, but it's like made specifically for our uh, eyeballs or for those of us who can see the three colors. Um, and plants perceive uh, light and shadow, um, but also in the area of the color spectrum, that's red and blue. Um, so like even if I were to walk by wearing uh, red or blue clothing, a plant could um, register that. Um, and plants have many other uh, mechanisms um, to perceive gravity and electric fields and water content of air and soil and touch and sound and the whole host of chemical interactions that are airborne or passing through the soil. And um, scientists are only still learning about many of these interactions. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to show the video anyways. I'm sorry if I break it. I just want you to see the moving image. Okay, never mind. It's okay, computer. I I believe you. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the work here includes video portraits of white pine and hemlock, um, as well as the ferns and forest flowers of this place, and they were recorded at a very high, at a relatively high frame rate, um, to create a sort of slower experience. Um, usually we like think of if we're imaging plants, often we're thinking of time lapse where we're um, shooting or taking a photograph occasionally so that we collapse that into um, a shorter time and it, we can like see plants moving and it sort of brings plants into this human realm. Um, but here and for the videos in the exhibition, I reverse this. So it's a way to sort of invite us into this slower, what I think of as like plant time. Um, and I also filter the videos into the area of the visual light spectrum that we share with plants, not only light and shadow, but red and blue. Um, and so, Cytovision I think of as um, both a practice of perception and a plant-oriented media. Um, so it begins as this experiment to destabilize the primacy of hum human vision and then to quietly open up a number of other modes of perception beyond the clear distinctions of our human senses. Um, and so here's a few images in the gallery. Um, there's also an element of tactility in this uh, exhibition. When I was visiting Cook Forest, um, I made some geophone recordings, which are recordings of the forest floor using a geophone, um, which is an instrument that's often used by geologists to measure um, underground movement. And so I transformed those recordings into a frequency that could be felt, um, if not sometimes heard. And um, in the center, there is the seating platform um, that's covered in felt, so you could sit on it and feel the vibrations. And on the right hand side, there's like this leaning wall. Um, and so there's transducers behind each of these sort of turning the surfaces into a kind of moving speaker um, of sorts. Um, and, oops, okay. Lost a, lost a couple of slides in the mix, but um, I thought I had an image of the geophone. Um, but I will say that um, while I was recording, um, making some of the geophone recordings, it's very humid atmosphere. Um, and so often I was there while it was raining. And so you can at times like feel the raindrops um, hitting the, the surface, um, sort of in reverse. Um, and so finally, the, um, the final element that I was working with in the exhibition was smell. And I was thinking about the airborne compounds that plants use for signaling. And so in this exhibition, um, I was working with terpenes, which were developed by early land insects and later used by land plants to confuse insects. And they're considered some of the most common chemical defenses. Um, and this is another place that I'd like to think about symbiosis. Um, walking into a pine and hemlock forest, you might notice that there are very few mosquitoes in the air, or other insects that um, we might consider pests. And the terpenes, while they're not necessarily signals for us or made um, for the human nose, um, they do, we, we can smell them and they do create a space that's very habitable. Um, but we'll get back to mosquitoes a little bit later. Um, for this 
So for this installation, um, I installed reed diffusers with custom scents, um, beginning with essential oil, oils from Canadian hemlock and white pine, um, amplified with some aroma chemicals. Um, so those included uh, alpha ter terpineol, which is like a terpy smell, that sort of turpentine kind of smell, um, isobornal acetate, which um, is a sort of woody or pine-like smell, and then humulene, which is a woody uh, smell that's also found in hops and cannabis. Um, and I, I did bring some uh, for you to smell if anybody's interested. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's the geophone recording. Um, you can sort of see, I have a very DIY setup. Um, <laughs> no, the alligator clips, but the geophone is there um, sitting on this log. It does give me a little bit more like ability to like set up to the site. Um, but yeah, and you can see like it's even already dripping with um, some of the humidity. And this is just a shot from uh, the forest and you can see just that like, yeah, very uh, foggy air. Um, and the last thing, uh, oh, and here's some images. They're a bit um, light in the room here, but these are some images of the reeds um, that are meant to diffuse the sense into the air. Um, and this is also, I'm sharing this with you as well to um, think about light, this sort of atmospheric approach um, oh, there, thank you. <laughs> um, so the whole installation was bathed in these red, red and blue lights, um, which is a spectrum perceivable by plants, um, which uh, turns into this vibrant magenta. Um, and you can see that it's also this like subtle color that really resists documentation. So this is my phone trying to capture <laughs> this magenta color and it's sort of moving back and forth. Um, and yeah, I'm interested to hear as well in the slower perspective of sort of becoming plant. Um, we'll never become plant or even necessarily understand. Um, but I'm interested in this possible overlap that we might be able to perceive in different ways the same phenomenon. Um, and as I mentioned in a talk previous, uh, closer to the exhibition, I'm also interested in these other forms of communication and signaling as forms of media. Um, what happens when we realize that these communications are all around us in the air and they're not made for us, they're not meant for us? Um, these ask some important questions. And um, like many people right now, I'm quite inspired by Dylan Robinson's work um, on Hungry Listening. And he talks about when a sound is not for you. Um, so I'm interested in the ways that not all messages are not for all of us. Um, and this is a, a reminder to me, I, I spoke about this earlier. Um, but it's this way to think about the sort of, res for me, a resistance to any urge to uh, assimilate. So how to sit with the incommensurable and then even find pleasure in it. And it's from this point of pleasure that I want to turn to some of these next pieces as well. Oh, here's the, some images of the lights during install. And again, that very tricky color to photograph. Um, these slides. Okay, uh, so these are just like a few slides from a, a field trip um, at the same time that I was making this phytovision work just down the road at the town of Shippingport. And this is at like a coal plant that was um, ended up closing just a couple months after this visit. And um, with a group of collaborator, like research collaborators, we would do these field trips um, visiting sites of like ecological and uh, industry in the area. Um, and uh, I didn't include slides in here about the Kinswa Dam, but um, this uh, area of Pittsburgh is like deeply embedded in this energy industry and the Kinswa Dam is an important um, part of this. That It's a dam that was built not only to lessen the flooding of the city of Pittsburgh, but also to generate hydroelectric power, but it was also done at the cost of displacing a very large group of the Seneca Nation, um, breaking a treaty that in itself was contested in the first place. So. The econ economic, ecological, and colonial history of the landscape is all intertwined in sites like these. And here I'm looking at the pokeweed and the goldenrod and the, um, the Queen Anne's lace that waft their volatiles into the air along with these sulfuric fumes from, that um, form the pools where slurry settled. So these sort of blends of volatile organic compounds. Um, and I'm interested in these kinds of landscapes and plants which grow at these edges of industry as um, particularly important plants that are already living within 
um, these regions. And um, there's some ongoing anti-colonial indigenous work about kinship relationships. Um, and I, I'm looking here to Kyle Powis White, who articulates um, powerful frameworks of the political implications of multi-species relationships and um, offers some helpful reminders about the difficulties of repairing or building relationships. And, um, and also to Michael Martyr and Patricia Vieira, who write, resistance to instrumentalization is a sure sign of love. Um, and I think this is an interesting starting point to think about symbiosis, because if we think about relationships only or primarily in terms of benefit or what we receive, then we run the risk of uh, developing relationships of care only for species who we understand as beneficial. Um, so in these last slides, if I have time, um, we'll talk about poison ivy and the mosquito and this other uh, sort of like um, stream of my work thinking about negotiating boundaries. Um, and as we know, poison ivy is a great uh, plant to think with about the boundaries of the skin especially for any of us in the room who are allergic, which includes myself. Um, so toxicogenin radicans contains a chemical called erucial, which causes reactions in uh, human skin ranging from non-existent to mild to severe. And I'm interested in this plant for a lot of reasons, but um, while I was reading about it, I was sort of piqued by this uh, study that was done that um, suggested that uh, poison ivy and poison sumac and and oak thrive under conditions of climate change. So rising CO2 levels can cause plants to grow larger leaves and to produce uh, more potent doses of erucial. I don't know if, okay, cool, different timer. <laughs> no worries, that's helpful. <laughs> um, and it's important to note as well that erucial is uh, not produced as a defense mechanism against humans, but it's a way to retain water and to protect against fungal infections. So I find it actually like incredibly disturbing and incredibly opening to learn that this pain is not intentional. It matters and it doesn't matter that it's not done to hurt me. Um, the other sort of interesting thing about poison ivy um, is that exposing oneself to poison ivy over time actually makes the reaction worse. Um, it has a cumulative effect causing increasingly severe reactions with each level of exposure. And so naturally, in the summer of 2015, I began offering erucial induced contact dermatitis as a form of temporary test twos. Um, in this, the toxic erucial is applied to the skin um, for exposure of about 20 minutes before being wiped off. And the erucial oxidizes upon contact with the air, um, turning a dark black or brown. So after a few days, a reaction occurs creating a raised irritation where the erucial was applied and removed. So for most uh, participants, this results in a small rash um, 24 to 48 hours later and lasting the whole thing lasting about two weeks. Uh, this is one of my favorite images. Um, this is the participant shared with me. Um, these are days one, four, and seven um, of the tattoo. And participants were also given pamphlets of information to provide some helpful information um, here's one of them here. Um, but the most important part of this project was the waiver, um, not, not because actually it would hold steam. Um, and this is, yeah, uh, I've like learned a lot more about um, research ethics boards since moving to Canada and doing this work. Um, I haven't done this work in Canada. Um, but uh, this waiver was important because uh, this is a document that acknowledges the risks in the encounter. So some of them were practical, like I'm not a doctor, um, but others were more emotional, um, describing the moments of waiting or the possibilities of irrevocable change. Thank you. Um, and um, maybe I'll skip through some of this other poison ivy work, which involved um, this process of enfleurage, a scent producing process, um, installing the work um, in a semi-public space that was on the inside of a wall. Um, and I'll end with, um, Oh yes, let me skip right through here. Um, I'll end with some work and some recent writing. Um, this is a piece co-written with um, a collaborator, Elke Mark, who's based in Flensburg, Germany. Um, and uh, for the book, Media Practice and Theory, edited by Nicole Debrandebeer, Debrand, Debrand, 
De Brebendaer, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, published by Vernon Press. Um, so Let Me Sip the Future Beyond My Blood um, was a performance piece from the summer of 2021. I was interested in working with mosquitoes, which were very abundant at the residency I was working at in Wisconsin. Um, and the piece was later performed as part of a, a festival in Chicago, Beyond Green. And um, it came out of the conversation with a friend there, Christy McGuire. Um, so at the residency, I learned that mosquitoes typically feed on nectar. Um, and the idea uh, that they, that female mosquitoes require a blood meal to lay their eggs. So this connection to reproductive, reproductive futures and the idea that my blood was offering a female mosquito the nutrients required to lay eggs, um, and also the idea that I could offer a sweet nectar instead inspired me to get a little closer to these insects. Um, so to begin, I created a mosquito attractant scent to hydrosol um, or hydro distillation made from sweaty socks, gruyere cheese, and uh, Daucus carota, which is a um, wild carrot family that um, is pollinated by mosquitoes. And um, scent chemicals from these objects were extracted in scented water. Um, and then I applied it to my skin in this sort of ritual offering to attract this uh, female mosquitoes. Um, it was also during this time that I was participating in um, a needling workshop, which is um, this other sort of form of uh, piercing for, it's sort of like, yeah, out of queer culture, piercing for pleasure, um, which I think was deeply connected to this process. Um, and um, as I learned more about the needles of the insects themselves, um, I was looking at some amazing work coming out of the Leo Lab at the University of California, Davis, and some of their uh, uh, science communicators there. Um, and I won't go into the details, but there's basically six needles that a mosquito uses first to saw into the skin, um, and then some to like peel the skin apart, and then the fifth needle um, to suck the blood up like a straw. Um, and um, it's this last place where I'm thinking about symbiosis. Um, the needle, uh, at the very end, the needle drips mosquito saliva into the body, and the saliva keeps the blood from coagulating when it hits the air. Um, but of course, this is also the moment of exchange, which marks dangerous or deadly diseases and that moment of being able to pass this from mosquito to human. So I'll end by saying um, exchange and recipro uh, reciprocity are not necessarily or even usually equitable. Um, and every encounter requires a negotiation of consent, power, dynamics, and risk. And we don't come to these encounters on equal footing. And in the paper, um, we work with Mary Louise Pratt's idea of the contact zone and some contemporary work relating this to um, more than human contact zones. And um, this is a, a quote by Aurora Levins Morales, um, sort of thinking about these connections. Um, maybe I'll end with this. I keep saying I'll end, but what would it mean if we took the sentiment seriously? Oh, this is not her quote. I'm going to move forward. Okay, uh, I'll read it aloud. What would it mean uh, what our bodies, my mother's and yours, and mine require in order to thrive is what the world requires. If there's a map to get there, it can be found in the atlas of our skin and bone and blood, in the tracks of neurotransmitters and antibodies. We need nourishment, equili equilibrium, water, connection, justice. And I wonder what would it mean if we took this sentiment seriously? Um, if we included the mosquito, this malign vector of disease within this world requiring nourishment, equilibrium, water connection and justice. And so while I think this may be a very expanded form of symbiosis, I do think that there's something about shared futuring with, with species that challenge us that I wanna bring into the conversation today. So thank you, and I'm sorry I also went over time <laughs> and had a couple of slide problems. Uh, I think it's this one, but you can, yeah. Is it a video? It's a video. Okay. okay. So, in the meantime, I'm going to introduce Doreen. So, Doreen Tisaguihashi Manning is an interdisciplinary artist and Queen's National um, Scholar in Anishinaabe language, knowledge, and culture. 
in the Department of Philosophy and Cultural Studies at Queen's University. Manning has expertise in Anishinaabe ontology, Nidu internationality, phenomenology, and art. A member of Catalan Stony Point First Nation, her primary philosophical influence and source of creativity is as her early childhood grounding in Anishinaabe onto epistemology. She is a principal investigator of earth diver, land-based worldling, and co-investigator on reversal warning with extended reality. Manning co-directs the cross-institutional peripheral vision collab, uh, which is a collaboration between New York and Queens. Uh, she is an affiliate of Revision Center of Art and uh, Social Justice and fellow of the International Institute for Critical Studies in Improvisation. So I think your video is set. So. I'll give you the mic. <laughs> when it's time, I'll, I'll get someone to turn it on. Or do I just press that arrow? Okay. I think you press that arrow, oh, and that's it. Much. And I, I don't think they heard my, OK, anyway. And as you know, so we have 20 minutes, and we'll tell you when. In the 1600s, as settlers colonized the Americas, the newly invented microscope led to the discovery of another new world, invisible to the naked eye. The detection of microworlds animated with tiny animals, wondrously hidden in drops of water, ignited Western imaginaries. Microscopy also contributed to a reductive view that geographer Jamie Linton calls modern water. Marked by a distinct habit of abstraction related to water that has given modern society license to adulterate, dam, divert, and contain water, resulting in significant social and ecological devastation. If water and other vital elements remain abstract as mere resources taken for profit, attitudes towards our biosphere and other than human worlds will not substantially transform. A radical shift in our very ontologies, our way of understanding reality, is required to move us away from human-centric motivations, toward a meaningful investment in ecologies as deeply interconnected and interdependent. Working with microscopic images of water found online as well as gathered from the marshy edges of the St. Lawrence River, emerging from the water, the digital gallery and artwork, restories water from the perspective of Anishinaabe ontologies. Microbial worlds teeming with living protozoa, plankton, bacteria, and algae our nido, or spirit, potency, potential, process, energy, expressed as that which is simultaneously happening and about to take place as emergent possibility. Water, nibe, is life. Nibe is our ancestor, mine and yours. A living multiplicity with whom we must renew our side, that is, the human side of the commitment to mutual respect and responsibility. Your grandchildren's drink. Zindo shin. Don suk. Panan. Nin de bi. Wewe ne wishi oyon. Wewe ne wishi tawat. Kyo be no chuk. Minwa. Kyo no shen suk. Water is alive. Water is alive. Water is alive. Nishnabekwen. Kim don suk. The tailed one was losing power, so they began seeing in their head. 
Kwanatan Kukalamsa Anayo Hao Tunstan Sa Haaya Nakukalamsa Nakwanata Coming to the end of their song, the tailed one reaches out grasping into the darkness. Finally, someone on the surface points out to the water. Look, there are bubbles over there. Sure enough, the tailed one floated to the top. Life and all of existence in Anishinaabe philosophies are taken up as a dynamic interrelational process composed of interacting potencies. Mortal, finite singularities commingle with the flocking wave of the infinite, the animate, multiple, and emergent character of Nado. Appearing as sheer potentiality, the formative dimension of the real, Nado alters the conditions of possibility, bringing new worlds into being. Like water itself, works of art are also Nado, emergent possibility, acting in the world in a field of living relatives and ancestors by creating immersive digital experiences of Nado interrelationality, emerging from the water summons Nado potency, reawakening human responsibility to Nebe. What a ring, what a spring, what a fresh, what a swamp, what a salt, what a ice, what a birth, what a snow, what a rain, what a spring, what a fresh, what a yo, what a love, what a yo, what a love, what a go, what a ring, what a spring. The rain might be your grandchildren's drink. Ah, can you hear me? Is this thing working? It should be working. Yeah, okay. Say something. Hello. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I'm good. Um, how about you? Um, to sorry, I see you know what you get away, go back, I just know because you can do them. Oh, you don't mind your budget. Um, Dolene Dow, that's how you know me by Dolene, as my you could say my English name. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about these uh, these uh, um. Symbiosis, um, ecology, maybe in a bit of a different way. Um, <clears throat> shoot, sorry. Okay, my phone is okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in that, uh, um, <clears throat> when thinking about this panel, I think it's okay. It's, there's nothing there. I, that will get in the way. I think that a lot of people do okay. it, so. Okay. <laughs> <There's> already <laughs> <up here>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm not the first? We don't want, yeah, and you don't want me to sleep. <laughs> it's okay, I won't go back there. <laughs> and think about this panel today. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I'm going to talk, I often, um, speak with my mother, speak to my helpers, say, you know, like, what is it? You know, what, what should I talk about today? You know? And uh, so a couple of stories kept coming to mind. And um, <clears throat> one of them from my, uh, from my uh, uh, early childhood. And uh, I remember being at home on my, um, my siblings were off at school and there was just my mother and I home. And, uh, <clears throat> And she catch me, catches me running across, streaking across the yard with this little can of gasoline and a pack of matches. <laughs> and she comes, you know, she comes running out to find out what, you know, what her young daughter is up to. <laughs> so I take her, I take her off to this, this anthill that's in the yard that I've already uh, kicked apart. 
and uh, <clears throat> and she's horrified. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I tell her, was well, you know, I'm just helping out my dad, you know, because I've seen him do that. He's he's cutting the lawn, and and uh, <clears throat> you know, like uh, I'm the youngest of twelve, and um, you know, we grew up in abject poverty, and. Uh, <clears throat> So whatever, you know, whatever equipment we had, you know, it was precious and it was, it was always on its last leg about to die. <laughs> so my dad, he'd be out cutting a lawn and he'd hit one of these ant hills and of course there'd be smoke and, you know, it might, it might kill his machine or, and he thinks it looks unsightly. My dad's white, he's Irish. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I don't ever remember setting them on fire. I do remember him pouring gasoline over them. <laughs> and uh, for me, um, you know, it made sense that gasoline and matches go together. So uh, I, that was my big plan, you know, that I was going to gasoline them up and set them on fire. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I might have been six or seven years old. You can imagine how horrified my mother was. <laughs> Her daughter's about to set herself on fire. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, so she wanted to know, why, why are you doing this? What, what was your, what's your plan here? And, and so I, I told her, you know, what, you know, I watched my dad do. And, and um, <clears throat> so as um, she said, you know, we don't do that. You know, that, you know, that white man, he does what he does. But we are Nishnabe. We don't do what he does. And uh, we don't behave that way. And um, <clears throat> so was my punishment. She made me sit there all day and uh, to, to watch them. And um, I thought that was enough, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because they've already been... Um, they've already been disturbed. They've already been violently uh, um, accosted. That um, you know, I've I've already kicked the, their home apart. They're they're all just they're they're um, mad with with fright, and you know they're terrified. They're running all over and disorganized, and they're uh, trying to put their home back together. Some are some of them are are are. Um, um, jumping ship and running away, <laughs> you know, they're, they're gathering up the eggs, trying to, you know, figure what to do with them, and others are starting to already rebuild, and, uh, <clears throat> and so there I sit, and of course, in the summer, my shorts, and I'm not allowed to harm them, not even one, so there you sit there, and you're going to watch me, she didn't make me sit on the hill, <laughs> Thank God, <laughs> but beside it, but just the same, you know, they're running like all over scrambling. And so I have them, they're all, you know, there's a bunch of them all running all over me as well. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that was so, you know, and then I'm to go back and to report. This is our, you know, this is how, um, this was our, 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 our form of teaching. In fact, I didn't go to school till I was my eighth birthday when uh, children's aid were going to take me away. That was, uh, that was like the cutoff point. And she told them that she was homeschooling me. So they'd send them books, you know, and she'd just throw them in the garbage. <laughs> and, uh, um, but this was one of our um, ways of um, teaching. So, um, and I, I was raising that since I was born. Like I remember being in the yard, sitting on her lap, and she, her hair, she was, it was much longer than mine when it was hot out. Um, I remember, so it was before I could walk. And she would have me sitting, and she'd have me in the yard. She's sitting cross-legged with me on her lap. And uh, I remember the sun being too bright. And uh, so she, she would lower her head, and she would form a curtain um, <clears throat> for me. And now, uh, but she would... Um, you know, talk to me in the language, tell me about creation stories, and then, um, <clears throat> and then we would do different kinds of sensory exercises. In this instance, um, now I'm I'm older now, and I like, and you've done this terrible thing, and so she makes me sit here and 
to study them. Um, they're my teachers. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so one day, next day, weeks, <laughs> ah, summer, this is my job. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, like I, I learned a lot of, um, I learned so much from them, from the ants. Um, <clears throat> but from my mother in this, you know, what, um, defining it in this way, I understood that as a Nishnaba, we have a different way of being in the world. Um, <clears throat> And that is that it's interrelational and interconnected. Um, and that uh, um, life, all life, and that absolutely everything is alive, not just plants or animals, but absolutely everything. And, uh, <clears throat> and that that is, uh, it, and it's a uh, deserving of respect. And that, you know, it's, it's actually uh, where we're, uh, minuscule in comparison, and uh, <clears throat> and that you under, we understand them as people. The people, the people come first. That's our job to um, put the people first. Well, not to say that we're you know we come up, become like a doormat. We're people too. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, <clears throat> oh, and another one was really important was that. Um, too is that we're not that the west was somehow different right that it didn't hold those same kinds of understandings that um which i would come to understand is imperialism um <clears throat> when we say that word uh, uh jaganash a lot of people think that means our uh, they often translated this as um, white people or white man there's neither is there a word white war Man, woman it is not even in that word, not at all. It refers to uh, British, not British soldiers. It, it refers to a way of being, and that way is imperialistic. And that's how we understand ourselves differently. Um, <clears throat> that it's a, in our logics, in our, the way that we are, that we logically understand the world. Um, <clears throat> is what drives our um our actions as well um so these are the kinds of things where brought me to philosophy that and having an ojibwe mother and a um white father and and uh, uh i didn't actually know he was white till i was quite old and and uh you know like my mom would have said that at that time i wouldn't even really understood what she meant it wasn't until actually i went to or took to school and um uh, um, and I was told that I was a dirty Indian. That uh, when I when I finally after my eighth birthday I went to school and I was told I was a dirty Indian. I was at the you know at the um, thing washing you know and uh, you know they look like a little semicircle um, sink for um, kindergartens. And there was a white boy there beside me and <laughs> washing. And he said, you're dirty. I said, I'm not. I, I really washed so good. And he, he put his arm beside me. He says, no, see, you are. You're dirty. <laughs> and I was really soaping up. No, I'm not. And so he went home and he comes back later and he says, oh, I found out why you're a dirty Indian. He says, um, or he said, I know why you're dirty. He says, um, my mom told me it's because you're a dirty Indian. That's where he comes so I, I went home and I never, you know, didn't hear that. I went home and I asked her, I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I went home and I asked my mom, what does this mean? Are we Indian? <laughs> and she asked though with a context, where did you hear this? And so I told her and she was furious and she says, no, she says, we're, we're, um, we're not Indians, we're, we're Anishinaabe. And she described what that, the interpretation of that is which is essentially, it's a, a, it's a highly ethical um, um, being, it's a, a way of being that's, that is, its ethicality is based in its um, interrelational way of being with all of existence. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, so from that, from that um, small interaction really um, shaped my whole world, shaped 
my uh, um, my desire to understand philosophy, to understand um, what spirit and uh, um, <clears throat> Later, I would see witness like a horrific car accident. And uh, I won't tell you the details, but <laughs> I do remember there was a there was a um, young man. I thought he was a woman. He had, you know, it was, it was in the, it was in the early 70s. He had hair, was <laughs> long hair, but he was um, on the ground and um, um, it was dark. And when there was a bunch of people and I was wandering around, I got lost and separated from my, my the rest of my, my siblings. And, and so there was a, a group of people. So I went over there because I was scared in the dark and I saw, <laughs> I could see some shadows. So I, I went and stood, there was a big man. I went and got right up close to him because I was scared in the dark. And I might've been about five and, and uh, they're all talking. At some point um, he turned his light on Turned out it was a cop, but <laughs> he turned his flashlight on and and um, and that light hit this. There was a man laying on the ground and just looked like he was taking a nap. You know, he's just, you know, just um, looked really casually um, uh, lying there. Right. And this but his hair was splayed right out in a fan all around from shoulder to shoulder. And it was it was yellow. I didn't see like such yellow hair before but with, with the light on it it would just shone it was like and i and it was like a uh, um halo okay and i saw oh, i i him, i took a big breath you know because i was so i was so sure that i had seen an angel and uh but when i did that you know like they all the cop beside me looked down and and he's like hey you shouldn't be and he tried to grab me i took off running and, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I always really thought about, you know, like when I was that, that age, you know, I, I thought, you know, when I was going home, what happened to that angel? Why are they there? And what are these white people, what are they going to do to them? <laughs> I know it's a woman actually, but, uh, um, like I, I was, you know, so, but I had this, uh, um, um, a deep uh, a, a concern about about spirit and uh, i often talked about you know heard that talked about in my home that you know talking about the spirits you know and, uh, and nishnabad talking about those kinds of things and i asked my mom what is that and she says look out there what do you see and i say you know i just start listing everything i see and she says that's it <laughs> it's all spirit it's all alive everything and uh, <clears throat> So for me in the work that I do, you know, like uh, you saw this, uh, we, or, you know, uh, this is Mary Bunch, this is my um, partner, and um, she's my life partner, but she's also my collaborator in the work that we're doing. We're doing a lot of work on in technology lately, and um, <clears throat> Mary Bunch and I created this work together. She is the real mastermind with the technology. <laughs> and uh, but a lot of these concerns with the uh, you know so i was late I, i've actually am one of my names is named after an insect so one of the things that i am concerned about is you know these these um the the tiny the tiny creatures you know tiny people and uh, <clears throat> so that's one of my uh um the the work that i do i I um, take up that responsibility. I mean, as part, it's, it is my responsibility that to, um, you know, we can think about, like we often think about uh, global crisis in a, in a large scale um, of uh, mass fires, flooding, but, you know, like if, uh, you know, if, our, our, if we don't, um, like our, we're so dependent on these, these tiniest of people for, for um, sustenance from from all the way across and to uh, uh, <clears throat> which is in part we're talking here about in this piece about the um, the finite and the infinite right? in that uh, from one hand as a, a nido or spirit you might know it as uh, uh, my mother translated it and lights that as uh, as uh, potency potential process 
and uh, <clears throat> I'm just closing up now. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> but that that is uh, um, this uh, um, Nido is uh, so if you think about like moving outside of our um, what we're accustomed to speaking in, in English, which is a colonial language. And uh, uh, we have to think of uh, English as just, oh, it's just a bridge language, we can all understand. But it is, is, it, it's potent, it's powerful, and it's, it's a colonial system. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so even thinking about that, uh, someone in my work, I often uh, question um, language and moving between English and Anishinaabe Moen and thinking about, um, like I say spirit, but then, um, that has all kinds of uh, connotations that related to Christianity. And uh, <clears throat> whereas in Nado is uh, potency, potential, process, energy, you can see that it's uh, so much more um, about a, 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 a perpetual movement, perpetual movement, right? When we think about our languages, Anishinaabe Moen languages are. 70 to 90 percent verbs so um you can see right off the bat like for us everything is absolutely alive why well, i have this in a i'm closing up very quickly <laughs> uh, why is this is important in uh, um <clears throat> is because we're talking about other than human more than human those kinds of concepts new materialism um i have a concern with that is uh um because this, this knowledge is indigenous knowledge, which is thousands of years old. Thank you very much for um, acknowledging that. I'm speaking to the other two speakers <laughs> today, but it's often not recognized. It's often not, it uh, understood. Actually, we showed this at the UN uh, water conference and somebody came running up afterwards to take photos. Because myself and another Anishinaabek I was talking about the, the water is alive. And this woman wanted to take a photo, photograph because she thought we got that from her business, which is, has, it's under, you know, it says something like water is alive. And she thought she was so influential that, she, that, <laughs> that it's gone around the world and indigenous people are now quoting her. And I said, no, no, that's indigenous. <laughs> you have gotten your influence by us, right? And, but so here's my concern is this, when we're talking about these different kinds of logics, one is imperialistic. And I would say, you know, I would caution people when we're talking about these kinds of movements to remember that you're deeply embedded, deeply inculcated in that imperialistic mindset. You can critique it, you can talk about it, but it's damn near impossible to actually root it out. Um, <clears throat> so for me, that's why it's important to make that uh, distinction that these knowledges are indigenous knowledges. This is where it comes from. And it's a different way of being, a way that I do think we share. Huh, miigwech. <laughs>